you know, I think it is anti-liberal to, to uh, take this position that we have a right not to be offended. Uh, I'm, I'm offended by the notion that I can't write something that offends people. <laughs> My name is Radley Balco. Uh, I'm a journalist. I work for the uh, Washington Post, where I'm a uh, reporter and blogger for The Watch, uh, a blog that uh, focuses on civil liberties in the criminal justice system. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, probably going back to elementary school. I majored in journalism and political science in college. Uh, I think it was really when I was working at the Cato Institute as a policy analyst on uh, kind of civil liberties issues. Uh, there are, I read a book by James Boulevard called Lost Rights, uh, another one uh, called Mugged by the State by Randy Fitzgerald, uh, which told a lot of these really uh, kind of terrifying stories about government abuse. And, you know, you read those stories and you just get kind of angry. And uh, I, you know, was, it, it was gratifying to me to see that there are people out there who are sort of bringing, shedding light on these kinds of abuses. Uh, and so I started uh, kind of focusing in on uh, civil liberties for Cato uh, and ended up writing a piece for Reason uh, on the Corey May case, which is about a kind of a drug raid gone bad uh, that ended in a, a death sentence with a guy that, who I think is innocent. Uh, and that really kind of gave me a Jones for uh, investigative reporting and it's kind of, you know, what I've been doing since. Nobody really uh, was doing criminal justice sort of uh, outrages, I guess, for lack of a better term, as a beat. Um, you know, there are plenty of crime reporters for major newspapers, uh, but no, at the time, I mean, I think it was kind of a beat that I, I kind of carved out at, uh, at Reason, actually. I started writing a regular column uh, looking at these issues. The momentum is, is on these issues is going to swing back and forth. I think part of it is just the pendulum sort of, you know, reached a climax in one direction and started swinging back the other direction. So now you start, you're starting to see a lot of kind of momentum for reform. Um, and with that, I think you've seen, you know, a lot of other journalists kind of move into this space. And, I mean, every week there are probably three or four really amazing investigative pieces, you know, that go up on criminal justice issues. I think it's wonderful. I mean, I'm glad to share the space. There's, you know, there's, uh, there's still way more material out there than there are people to cover it. Uh, so I hope we get more. Uh, I don't necessarily think that journalism, uh, you know, is inherently more pro First Amendment than other professions, though, uh, as much as I would like to believe that. Um, I mean, anytime I think you get sort of outside the immediate kind of, you know, um, uh, free speech issues, which no reasonable person is on the opposite side of speech. As soon as you get into things like campaign finance uh, and, you know, political speech, uh, you very quickly see journalists and journalists, in, you know, publications uh, jump ship. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think free speech is incredibly important. As a journalist, I think it's incredibly important. Um, I mean, I think part of um, the advantage of kind of the technological age we're, we're in right now is that anybody can be a journalist. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think anybody that's doing reporting, anybody that's sort of relaying information to the public uh, deserves, you know, the kinds of protections that we give to journalists. No, but, uh, you know, I think it is anti-liberal to, to uh, take this position that we have a right not to be offended. Um, I mean, I think uh, philosophically, I think it's really problematic. Uh, I think it, you know, butts heads directly with any kind of notion of free speech and free press. Um, this idea that the state is going to sort of step in and decide who gets protected from offense and who doesn't. Uh, but also just practically, it's, it's an impossible uh, standard to enforce. I mean, um, everyone's offended by something. You know, uh, I'm, I'm offended by the notion that I can't write something that offends people. <laughs> um, you know, at, at some level, at some level, some, you know, government official is going to have to decide whose claims to offense uh, are legitimate. We need to live in a society where you can say whatever you want, you know, whenever you want, uh, as long as, you know, you're not causing direct harm or violence to someone. I think it's threats to free speech in America today. Um, I mean, I think it comes from an, a, a few places. I think one, I think there is a, you know, despite the fact that we have a, a pretty robust First Amendment, I think there is a threat of uh, government sort of cracking down on uh, what's seen as extremism. Um, I mean, we're seeing this in the UK, which of course, you know, doesn't have the, the, free, the free speech tradition we do here, but is still considered kind of a liberal Western democracy. Uh, where, you know, just this week actually, or last week, I guess, David Cameron announced, you know, these series of policies to eradicate extremism. Um, that's terrifying when you think about it. I mean, if you look back on U.S. history and the people who were considered extremists, you know, in their time, uh, you know, you're talking about abolitionists, right? Uh, you're talking about 
uh, you know, people who uh, advocated for desegregation, uh, you know, people who advocated against lynching. You know, there's the problem of, uh, of kind of direct censorship, of government censorship, but you know, and there's also the problem of uh, what you might call kind of light censorship or, you know, social censorship. Uh, and I do think we're also kind of moving in a direction where, um, you know, uh, grievances are uh, kind of waged in public against people for saying things that are, you know, offensive to some groups, deemed politically incorrect. And, you know, that's an issue I always kind of struggle with as a libertarian because on the one hand, I think that things like boycotts uh, and, uh, you know, sort of social activism and social pressure are a good, you know, non-coercive way of dealing with um, you know, of, of sort of correcting behavior and kind of moving society in the direction we wanted to go in. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, it, it is kind of troublesome uh, when, to the extent, the extent to which that kind of activism has been taken today, where um, I think it's becoming sort of it's limiting creativity in, in some ways. It's certainly limiting, you know, in fields like comedy, uh, you know, entertainment, um, and academia. Uh, and so, you know, there is this kind of uh, light uh, central censorship or social censorship that, you know, I don't think is as cut and dry as government censorship, but you know, when kind of employed the wrong way, it can still be pretty troubling. One of the things I really admire about FIRE is the fact that their only real ideology is free speech, that, um, you know, whether it's a, you know, professor who has been, you know, sanctioned for criticizing Israel or a sanction has been, you know, sa uh, sanctioned for uh, criticizing, um, you know, Muslims, um, you know, FIRE is going to be there sort of defending that professor's right to speak. Um, you know, I've, I've, if you go through the list of, uh, you know, commencement speakers that have been disinvited uh, that FIRE has spoken up on behalf of, uh, you know, they run, it's pan-ideological, runs, you know, the length of the ideological spectrum. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think that's, important, uh, it's admirable, but it's also really uh, important that we have organizations like that that are willing to kind of put, make civil liberties sort of the priority, the only ideology that they have. Um, FIRE has always done that and uh, I've always had a lot of respect for them for that. Mm -hmm.